Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see that we have people here in-house worshiping with us this morning. And good morning to those who are joining us online. Um, obviously, I am not Ross Carter. My name is Patty Geppinger, and I am um, going to be leading praise and worship today with this great team behind me. Um, if you didn't know, Ross needed a little bit of a break. Actually, he and Emily and uh, another couple and their children are headed out west. So they're doing the All West Tour, and he's going to be gone for the next couple weeks. And he deserves to be rested, that's for sure. The guy does a lot of work around here. So Ross is um, on his way out west. We'll see him in a couple weeks. But meanwhile, um, this fabulous team up here is going to lead you in praise and worship. So with that being said, uh, we're going to start right off the bat with um, any announcements that we have. Uh, Susan? I have a few announcements. Of course, Peace Meals are still going on on Wednesdays from 5 to 6. It is still curbside pickup only. And we are live streaming the Ignite service at 7 p.m. However, you are able to come in and worship with us in, in the sanctuary. I uh, just want you to let, to let you know that the Ohio Health Mobile Mammography Screening Unit will be here on August 5th, on, and they will be here from 9 to 3 they do require you to sign up ahead of time. There is a, a small picture on our webpage where you can get the phone number. I'll read it off to you, but you can go there if you miss this. It's 614-566-1111 or 877-566-1112. Our tower chimes for August and September deadline is coming up tomorrow. So if there's any information that you need to get into that, please send that information to the office as soon as possible. Uh, the church is also looking for a part-time secretary. The benefit of that is you get to work with me and the pastor, I guess, too, but <laughs> mostly it's me. Uh, so if you are interested in that, please uh, send your resume to the church and we will uh, be working on um, filling that position. Um, also, this afternoon from 2 to 4, we are celebrating with the Lamb family Russ Lamb's 90th birthday. It is a surprise party, but it's today, so I think we're okay, you know, not, not, not letting him know. Um, so if you would like to celebrate with him, please, please come into the church in the great room between 2 and 4 today. Big announcement. We can't believe it. It's already here. Next Saturday is VBS. Calvary is still looking for a little bit of help, so if you would like to help with that, get in touch with Calvary. Just call the church office. We'll make sure we get you in touch with her. It is from 9 to 3 for kids in grades 1 through 6. Also, remember that prayer requests and praises, there's a box in the back of the church that you can put your information in if you need some prayer or if you have a praise that you would like to get out there. We have our intercessory prayer, I can't say that, intercessory prayer team, praying on Monday afternoons. So if you are not in the building and you would like to get that information to us, please email me, Susan Grog, at freddyumc.org. One other announcement would be about offering. We are still excited that everyone is still helping and supporting the church and the ministries that we have here, and, and we just thank you and praise the Lord that we're, we're so giving and so loving and, and helping. So there is a box here in the church in the back upstairs for those who are here. You can also give online if you go to the web page. Awesome. Yeah, that's a lot of announcements. Um, but things that are valuable for you to know. In addition, I want to bring something else up to our loving church family. Um, and this has to do with our speaker last week, uh, Jacob Yoder. I don't even know. I thought I saw. Oh, he is here. If you're not watching, he's in the back. And uh, he is going into full-time missions, and he is going to need um, a lot of financial support. Matter of fact, all support. Um, so my husband, as he thinks, like a money guy, um, he says, you know, this is so simple. He said, if, if we had 30 families in the church give $50 a month, that would make Jacob's, you know, uh, monthly needs. That would be his $15 a uh, month. Hundred dollars, yeah, he needs more than fifteen, uh, fifteen hundred dollars a month that he needs to survive on, and so he breaks my husband breaks it down for me even more, and he says, you know, it's real simple. He said if ev thirty families gave twelve dollars and twenty five cents weekly, that's twenty five dollars every two weeks, which is 
$50 a month. Did I get that right, Ken? Oh, so I'm really close. So anyhow, $12.25 a week. $12.50 a week. Yeah, I teach math. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the point is this. 50, uh, 30 families, $50 a month, and that's Jacob's support. If you guys saw him last week and heard his presentation and you watched the video and you saw the light in this guy's eyes, he's the real deal. He needs to be supported. And as a church family, you don't have to go on a mission, but you sure can support someone who is. So there's our call to you. And uh, I am sure if you have um, that uh, in your mindset, you can call the church, you can talk to Jacob, um, but they have it all set up for him. So finances are important, and we as a church can support him. So let's think about doing that, okay? All right, so question, ready? Before we start a praise and worship, this is a little, little question for you. What do these people have in common? Ready? Elijah, David, Ezekiel, Moses. Anybody have an idea? Come on, church family, throw it out there. I, the youth are yelling out. How's come the adults aren't? What do you think it is? <laughs> and he got it on. I don't know what Calvary Kirshner's teaching you folks, but she is right on target. These guys are all prophets. And what does a prophet do? Ah, speaks directly to the people for God. So God uses prophets to speak to. Uh, the first song we're going to be singing is the very first line is called, These Are the Days of Elijah. And guess what our pastor's speaking on today? The prophet Elijah, along with these other prophets we're going to be singing about. What does a prophet do? Brings the message to the people. It's encouragement. It's good news. It's hope. It's about restoration. It's about salvation. So if you will stand up with us, if you'd like, you may join with us. And we are going to start off with Days of Elijah. All right. Come on, team. Let's go.
the fields are white. That means it's ready for harvest. That means the world is ready to hear. So we're going to hear more about Elijah when pastor preaches and the scripture is read. But what we're going to find out is that Elijah, not only was he a prophet, he was a listener. He heard what God had to say. And guess what else he was? Obedient. He heard what God had to say. He went out and did it. There was a lot of questions about poor Elijah and how he was going to survive this because what he had to do wasn't the greatest thing. But God called him to do it, and he did it. And you know what he had to do? He had to rely on God to take care of the rest. And God did. God is faithful. Walking around these walls Oh, I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet I'm waiting for change to come I'm knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Come on, here we go. Your promise still stands. And great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my comfort. Promise still stands, great is 
that several times in his journey, which we're going to hear about today. We are introducing a somewhat new song to you today. Um, it's actually an old hymn that's just been rewritten um, to a, a, a little bit more contemporary version. It's called Cornerstone. And I actually took some time and I looked it up. What on earth is a cornerstone? So I'm going to read you what the dictionary said, okay? It said the cornerstone is is the first stone that is laid down when you're doing um, construction of some kind of a foundation, right? You've got the cornerstone. And then all of the other stones that are set are in relation to this particular stone. So this stone gives the rest of the foundation its frame and its steadiness and its squareness. Um, depending on this cornerstone, all the other stones are put into place and they all depend on the stone. I looked up scripture because you know what? Scripture gives us a definition of the cornerstone. And this is what it says in Ephesians 2.20. It says, you too, you too, us, you too are built upon a foundation. Sounds familiar. But this foundation is laid by the apostles and the prophets like we're going to hear about today, Elijah. The cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. This song, Cornerstone, is all about hope. There may be some of you out there that are feeling hopeless. There may be some of you out there um, who are watching us live now that know exactly what that feels like. And the word hope may have been taken out of your realm of understanding. I'm going to tell you today, as sure as I stand here, there is hope. And the hope is found in Christ himself. Amen? If you want that hope, go to Jesus himself. Here we go with Cornerstone. changing grace in every heart 
trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne, faultless, and Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. Let's all join our voices. Come on, it's Christ. We go. Christ alone. God, you are Lord of all. You are. There is no way we can stand here and profess anything else. If you don't know that today, let this be the day that you know. Because when you know Christ, you have hope. And when you have hope, you can see through tomorrow no matter the circumstances. We thank you, Father, for giving us that hope. Making every day full of your mercy new and to start again. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. And we look forward to knowing you more and more each day. We pray this in the holy, precious Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Um, at this time, we're going to have the uh, Zimmermans come up, and uh, they're going to talk a little bit about um, their uh, trip with the kids that they did recently. And I'm pretty sure we're having pizza pies and cherry pies because I see a whole bunch of irons sitting right there on that pew. If you're at home, you can't see it, but I can. So... Did you bring the stuff, Brian? He says no. I think we ate most of it. He ate it. <laughs> thanks for, that's one of the things we definitely want to say is um, thank you for everyone who provided food for the kids for the couple of days that we were doing things. Um, we, uh, we last, would be a week ago, Thursday and Friday, we did a day of a mission trip at the Center of Hope. And then on Friday, we had some fun and went tubing and um, played in the water and had a good time. So, All right, so we have Donnell from the Center of Hope, and she's going to come up and talk a little bit about the center for us. All right, guys, come on up, too. Good morning, everybody. Um, how many here have heard of the Center of Hope? A couple of you, maybe. Um, well, we are fairly new to Knox County, but not a new organization. My family and I live here. In fact, we're very proud to call this church our home. Um, but we just started coming prior to COVID, and so we had the pleasure of sometimes joining you with our fuzzy slippers on from home over the last couple months. Um, but we've also had the privilege of getting to know people here in our community um, by coming alongside our Peace Meals team on Wednesday night to distribute food and food provisions to families to take home. Um, but also during um, Missions Week, 
We also had the opportunity to host this amazing um, group of individuals here. And I thought that maybe they should share with you a little bit about what is Center of Hope, because you're probably wondering. Um, and so I'm just going to pass this to a couple people here, and they can tell you a little bit about us, and then I'll finish up. Hey, guys. So it's me, Macy Thorne, and I went on the trip with the youth group with this. And I just wanted to start out, when we first went in there, it's the old, what school is it? Bladensburg High um, Elementary School. So it looks like a school still when you go in there. It's just kind of cool of how their goal, um, how they support and go out to the community. Like they have so many food and help. My job was helping pack fresh food for the people and giving it to other people so they can give it out to the cars and people who need help. And the one thing I find really cool that they're doing is reach with also with just reaching out with people is that they're trying to make this feel more like a home in a friendly environment. Not just another, it's not going to be just another food pantry or just another food bank or something like that. It's going to actually be a place where these people can come and say, and they're working on getting further out where they can have shop classes, art classes, cooking classes, in a place where everyone can just be a community together and just be in God's worship and home. Hi, I'm Taylor. Um, during the Center of Hope, I worked on painting there. So that was kind of fun. We painted more on ourselves than the walls, I think. And, but it's really interesting just to see how they give the proper food and nutrition to the people that, they, that need it and everything. And that it can be really anyone. Because like, they could be sitting next to you and you wouldn't even know it because they're just too scared or nervous to share that they need those needs and stuff. Hi, my name is Annabelle. Um, my job was to help give the food to people that pulled up in their cars. Um, I was working with Assistant Director Taylor, and we would have the list of the people that were coming, and they had a specific time that they had to come and get their food. And when someone would pull up, we would go get the cold stuff, which was milk, eggs, and butter. No cheese, not butter, sorry. And then we would give them either one bag of, like, fresh produce or two bags. It depends on how many people were in their household. Um, and I was thought it was really cool that Taylor knew whose car it was and, like, their personal story. Yeah, they had a list of who, like, the names, but, like, she knew them, like, deep connection. And I thought it was pretty cool that she knew not just who they, who they were, but, like, who they were. Okay, uh, my name is Zach, and my job there was to pull down ceiling tiles and gridding, because what they're trying to do is they're trying to make the school more open and welcoming to the community, because right now it still looks like a school, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to take down all the ceiling tiles and make it more open so it's more welcoming to everybody, because what it is is it's a giant food bank that serves that entire community there, so everyone who needs help can just get it whenever they need it, so what they're doing is really cool for that community. And they actually help ours too. They bring food every Wednesday. And they actually help with the piecemeal as well as just delivering food for people around that need it. So what they're doing is super incredible and I hope they can keep it up. Well, my name is Andy and my job was to clean carts so they could use it to transport food from cars that have been delivered that have, they've donated food to, they can transport the, they put it on the carts and they transport it to like the freezer rooms and the cupboards. Hi, my name is Austin Gershner, and I did what Zach did. I took down ceiling tiles and gridding and cut the wire and kept the wire so the lights wouldn't fall down when you pulled down the grid. <laughs> and just. <laughs> uh, I'm Zane, and I did the exact same thing as Andy. I had to clean carts off pretty much and did a little bit of demo. So thank you guys, and, and I, I give all of them really credit. A few of them didn't really want to talk this morning, and they did anyway, so thank you. But what they also did was they came and they shared smiles and warmth and just really loved on our neighbors. And, and we, we call the people that we serve our neighbors because they really are our neighbors. Um, a lot of people hear about the poverty in Knox County and the surrounding rural communities, um, but um, we have a community problem to solve, and we need everybody's help to solve it. 40% of our community are working yet still struggle to get their basic needs met. 
and are at risk for food insecurity. And food insecurity is often hidden. Um, it could be your neighbor. It could be the people that you work with. It could be the people here in, in church with you. Um, hunger is often disguised. Um, and oftentimes people will compensate and not get the healthy foods that they need. Um, and then, then from there comes health problems and all sorts of other complications um, for individuals. So part of our goal is not just to get food to people that need it, but to get consistent, healthy foods to them. Um, and so we're, we're very blessed to be serving an amazing community. But on top of that 40%, about 25% of our community are seniors. Many seniors have retirement, have done all the right things, but are still feeling pinched because the cost of living has gone up and up. Um, so prior to COVID, we estimated that 65 to 70% of residents in Knox County were at risk for food insecurity. Um, because of that reason, we don't just serve people on a monthly basis, we serve people on a weekly basis so that we can help to um, reduce some of that anxiety and ensure that they're getting fresh foods on a regular basis. So we're working really hard from our distribution center in Bladensburg to really grow that and to make it a hub from which we can distribute food across the county because we have over 500 square miles to serve. Um, so I hope that you will find out a little bit more about us and talk to all these amazing um, young adults here. Um, about their experience out there, and um, I hope that maybe you'll get involved with us at Center of Hope. All right, guys, and just again, thank you. If you donated any food to us uh, during the, those two days, it was um, an amazing gift that you guys gave them. So thank you again. All right, so scripture this morning is from 1 Kings 17, 1 through 7. <clears throat> and then this happened. Elijah, told, Elijah the Tishbite from among the settlers of Gilead confronted Ahab. As surely as God lives, the God of Israel before whom I stand in the obedient service, the next years are going to see a total drought. Not a drop of dew or rain unless I say otherwise. God then told Elijah, get out of here and fast. Head east and hide out at the Kareth Ravine on the other side of the Jordan River. You can drink fresh water from the brook. I've ordered ra the ravens to feed you. Elijah obeyed God's orders. He went and camped in the Kareth Canyon on the other side of the Jordan. And sure enough, ravens brought him his meals, both breakfast and supper, supper and he drank from the brook. Today's the first uh, sermon in a series we're beginning on the um, little character study of Elijah and his life. He is my favorite. He's my favorite among the Old Testament prophets. <clears throat> He's different in some ways um, than, than some of the other prophets, which we'll outline here shortly. But um, I'm indebted, um, had a lot of sources, R.T. Kendall, Charles Swindoll, some commentaries, um, we'll be using those uh, throughout this series. One of the things that's different about Elijah is that he just pops up out of nowhere. There is no, oftentimes in a Bible, when the Bible is introducing or building up to a character, uh, such as David, uh, you'll see where, you'll see his lineage. You'll see the people that uh, were his ancestors. Uh, you don't see this with Elijah. Elijah just seems to appear out of nowhere, without any warning or explanation. Uh, he is referred to as Elijah the Tishbite, uh, because he was from Tishbe in Gilead. And he just appears before King Ahab. And King Ahab and his wife Jezebel were the worst king and queen Israel ever had. They were terribly evil. They led Israel astray in their faith. And so God decided, you know, at some point, a tipping point occurred... And God sent Elijah to, to spearhead dealing with uh, Ahab and Jezebel. And Elijah appears before Ahab. And he says, King, there's not going to be any more rain. No more rain, not even a drop of dew, except at my word. <clears throat> there had been nobody 
There had been no one since Moses who had made such a bold, bold claim. Now, as I said, he was living in an evil age when uh, Ahab had led the Israelites away from God. They, they were worshiping other gods. Uh, more of them, sadly, more of the Israelites were worshiping other gods than were worshiping the true God of Israel. So Elijah is living in a difficult time. You know, we sometimes, we sometimes want the situation or want a situation that looks easy to us. Lord, send me to a place of employment where every other single person there is a Christian and we can just sit around all day and sing kumbaya to each other and it'll just be wonderful going to work every day. It doesn't work like that. Uh, we want the nice situation and God oftentimes is looking for the person to fit into the difficult situation. And so instead of asking God, God, send me a cushy, a cushy location or a cushy situation, we should simply say, God, send me. God, send me. And leave it up to God where to send us. And then know that we are there by God's hand and act on behalf of God through the power of God. God, is will God wants to see People, he's looking for people who are willing to go outside their comfort zones. Paul in the New Testament. Where did Paul say he wanted to go? Where did he say he wanted to go? He says, I want to go. I want to go where the gospel has not been preached before. In other words, that's the toughest. That's the toughest, in some ways, the toughest places to go are where the gospel has never been preached. I love this quote from John Wesley. Uh, as he saw the wickedness in Newcastle, England. Listen to this quote. Never in my life have I heard such language, such swearing, and have seen such wickedness. Ripe for revival. Ripe for revival. Now, we are in a time in our world where tempers are short, where patience is thin, and true tolerance True tolerance is scarce. Followers of Christ, as followers of Christ, we need to stand out in stark contrast to the way the world's going right now. We need to emulate those like Elijah who lived in difficult times. I'm not going to soft soap it for you. This is, these are difficult times we're living in. There's a lot going on and, quite frankly, no end in sight. But he stood. He lived for the Lord and stood for the Lord um, for all to see. Now we could run away. We could say, you know, let's just cloister here in the church. Let's just kind of keep into our own little corner and stay out of trouble and, and not try and make a difference. We could do that. We could run from our responsibilities. Or we could take Wesley's position and Paul's position and see things, no matter how difficult, as a sign that God might step in soon. And this is a promise from God. God desires to step in. And God desires to step in soon. God sent Jesus into the world when things were at their worst. So we should not always be looking for a better situation. Before we ever ask God to change our situation or location, ask God first to help us help you thrive where you are and be obedient to his leading. Now, the way Elijah, as he confronts Ahab, the way he identifies God is no accident. Elijah calls God the living God. He not only exists, but he's alive. He's active. Ahab was a worshiper of Baal. Uh, Jezebel brought that religion into their marriage. Baal was known as the storm god. And Baal is always depicted in, in uh, drawings as holding a lightning bolt in his hand. And so that's going to be a key, uh, be a key component later on when, Baal con or when, when uh, El Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And Elijah is going to say to these prophets, okay, you worship this fire god? You worship this god of the lightning? He said, let's... And you recall what happened next. They built altars and... Uh, they called down, and the God who answered by fire, that was God. 
That was Elijah saying, I'll step into your wheelhouse. I know who God is. I'm confident in who God is. So I'll step into your wheelhouse. Let's call on your fire God and see what he can do. And of course, you remember the rest of the story. And we'll look at that here in a couple of weeks. But Elijah's saying to Ahab, God knows what you've been doing. He's not ignorant of these things. Here are the consequences of your sin. It's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. And Elijah also calls God the God of Israel, the God who made covenants with the the people. The God that we have a long history with, Elijah is saying. The God he's saying to Ahab, the God you should know and the God you should be serving because you're king of this country. You're the king of this country that he's been so good to. Folks, there's nothing wrong with saying to our elected leaders, You should pay homage to God because you're the leaders of this country and God has been so good to this country. You you folks are the ones who are leading and so you should know Him and you should be unashamed to follow Him. And Elijah also identifies himself with God. He tells Ahab that God is the God he serves. His allegiance is not to Ahab. He is a servant of the God of Israel. And what he says to Ahab is not just a promise from God. A promise in the Bible is conditional. Promises in the Bible are conditional. In other words, God says, if you do this, then I'll do that. 2 Chronicles 7.14, that talks about a conditional promise from God. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal their land. That's a conditional promise from God. It's conditioned on us doing our part, humbling ourselves, praying, turning from our wicked ways. An oath, on the other hand, is unconditional. And that's what Elijah shares with Ahab from God, is an oath from God. God is going to do this. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) God is going to do this. No matter what else happens, God is going to send the drought. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years. An oath by God can be made in wrath, as he did when he told the Hebrews that generation would not enter the promised land, or in mercy, as when he told Abraham that his descendants would be as innumerable as the sands of the seashore. But when God announces an oath, that's what's going to happen, regardless of anything else. And that's what happened here. And by the way, in the book of James, chapter 5, verse 17, it tells us that Elijah not only prophesied this to King Ahab, but that he prayed. It said he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. Almost certainly, no, I should take away the almost. Certainly, he prayed before he pronounced. Even things we feel confident about, things that we've heard from the Lord about, we need to keep praying about, as Elijah did. And so he has proclaimed this drought to the evil king Ahab. So what's he do now? What's his next step? Well, when we're walking with God, the Holy Spirit always knows the next step that we're to take. And so it's important for us to be in step with the Holy Spirit and step with the Lord, and he will lead us step by step to where he wants us to go. And what was the next step for Elijah? Get out of Dodge. Get out of there. He was was to head east. He was to cross over the Jordan River and settle in the Kirith Ravine. It is a remote place. It's an easy place to hide in. God told him to go there because for the next few years, Ahab was going to be hunting for him. Elijah is now the most wanted man in the country. He's going to be hiding in that ravine for a good long while because the drought's on, food's scarce. God says, go there and I will provide for you. I will order the ravens to feed you. Morning and evening, they're going to bring food to you. That is remarkable. But what is actually going on here is something even more remarkable. God is training Elijah. He is training him to rely on him every day, to stay close to him at all times. 
Ahab and Jezebel are the two most wicked rulers Israel's ever had. They have rushed headlong into their pursuit of other gods. And they are leading the country to do the same. And to confront their great sin. To turn the nation around. God needed somebody tough. Somebody who would not bend under pressure and compromise. You might think that after Elijah had pronounced the judgment of the drought to Ahab, God would have kept him right there in Ahab's face, reminding him of his displeasure. But no, God says through Elijah, not going to be any rain at all. And then God tells Elijah, leave, get out of there, go to the Kirith Ravine and hide there. Live by the brook. Elijah needs to be kept safe from the search parties of the king. But he also needs training. This is a great, great man of God, but God is still training him. And he needs training in God's faithfulness because he's certainly going to need it down the line when he confronts the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Anyone, listen to me folks, anyone used greatly by God must first be humbled by God and the people must learn to trust him if you're going to be used mightily by God. Now, when Elijah first appears on the scene, he is referred to as simply Elijah the Tish Tishbite. Name, where he's from. But later in the chapter, after he's had his time there at the brook, after he's learned to rely and trust in God, he's addressed as a man of God. When all this was going down with Ahab and Jezebel, when they were dragging the country away from God, God looked for someone whose heart was fully devoted to him. Someone who was tough. Someone who would stand alone and have the courage to say, this is wrong. We can't keep going this way. Society <coughs> today, in our schools today, in our workplaces today, we need men and women who are willing to stand alone with God. Does our country have issues? Absolutely. Our country is not what it should be and could be, and some things deserve to be confronted and changed. <clears throat> but do you really think any of those who rioted and destroyed things would be willing to stand alone like Elijah did? Or did they find courage because they thought they were in the middle of a mob? That's not the courage of Elijah. He didn't have thousands of people with him. As far as he knew, and this was, this was not true, but he honestly thought he was the only one left in Israel who served God. He thought he was the only one. But he was not just a nameless face in a crowd. He was a man of steel. Steel that was toughened by the training God gave him. The Bible says that God looks throughout the land for a heart that is fully devoted to Him. As God looks around today, can He say that one's heart is completely mine? There is sufficient commitment there to me that I can really make a difference through them. That's the kind of devotion God is looking for. Now let's boil this down a little bit further. Let's boil this down a little bit further. The Bible, yes, it does say God's looking throughout the land for a heart that's fully devoted to Him. But let's just boil it down and say God's looking here in the sanctuary today. He's looking at all of you. And through all the congregation, He's looking at all of us. Can He point to anyone here and say, That one's heart, that one's heart is devoted and committed to me. That one's heart, I can do something with them. I can minister through them. I can make a change through them. Anybody have a heart like that today? Anybody have a heart like that? For God like that today. One of the things I really enjoy about living in this town is going to the school plays. I so enjoy seeing our talented kids. And some of the kids have had leading parts. Others have had supporting roles. But one thing I have noticed about our kids in the plays, they don't blend in. They stand out. They all make the most of their time on stage. No matter what role God has given you in life, it's an important role. The one that God created with you in mind. Make the most of your time on the stage of your life. Be willing to stand out and stand up for God. 
don't just look to blend into the background. And when Elijah confronts Ahab, he is saying to him, Ahab, you're not, you're not the most powerful force in this land. The most powerful force in this land is God. Can you stop the rain, Ahab? Well, God can. He can for as long as he chooses. Well, now let's fast forward. Let's fast forward a little bit. Uh, I think it was more than a year, and I think Scripture intimates it was more than a year. Um, Elijah's been hiding in the ravine by the brook. It has been a great faith-building exercise for him. It is such a wonderful feeling when we're in the middle of God's blessings. It's usually much easier to praise the Lord when, you're, when your desires are being met. The ravens have been bringing him food twice a day. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say he's been there a year. Let's say he's been there a year. That's uh, 360 some days, okay? That is over twice a day. That's over 700 times that those ravens have brought him food morning and evening. Can you imagine the opportunity, the, the opportunity for faith building that was? Perhaps Elijah was, uh, was getting along toward late afternoon, or perhaps he woke up from a restless night and he was concerned and his faith was wavering and he was wondering, oh, you know, God, did I do the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? <clears throat> Am I, he's, he must have questioned himself. And then as he's struggling with that, there comes the ravens. There comes the ravens with the food. His faith was being built up. Well, one day, after an indetermined, undetermined length of time, Elijah looks at the brook. And the brook's not flowing quite like it usually does. The brook is slowing. The flow of the brook is slowing. It's down to a trickle. And as the drought continues, the brook dries up. And by this time... Elijah has seen God provide for him every day. And he has understood where God leads, God will provide. That is a universal truth, folks. Where God leads you, God will provide for you. As long as you are following God's leading, God will provide for you. But I do wonder if he, when the brook dried up, if he started wondering, did I make a mistake here? Did I get it wrong? You ever felt like God's broken his word to you? After all, God promised that Elijah would drink from that brook, but now there's no brook to drink from. But God had provided for him. But now in this critical point, it's becoming more difficult for Elijah to believe with the brook drying up. Maybe Elijah thought he would be the exception in all of Israel. Maybe he thought, because God, I'm serving you, Everybody else's source of water is drying up, but you're going to keep that here at the brook flowing. You're going to keep it flowing. That's how our minds tend to work, that we're going to be exempt from everything that's going on in, this, in our country, in our nation, but we're not. We're not. Vance Havner, in his book, It Is Toward Evening, tells the story of a group of farmers who were raising cotton in the, deer, in the uh, deep south. They had sunk every penny they had into their fields of cotton. And just... As they bought all this land, sunk all their money into planting cotton, the boll weevil hit. The boll weevil hit. And before long, it looked like all these farmers were headed for the poorhouse. But farmers are smart people. And as they looked at the situation, they said, well, we can't plant cotton, so let's plant peanuts instead. And those peanuts brought them more money than they would have ever made raising cotton. And when the farmers realized that this had turned out for their benefit and that God, was, God had provided for them uh, through this, they got together and they raised a monument. I believe that monument is still in existence down south. It is a monument to the boll weevil. The very thing that they thought would destroy them. Sometimes as Christians we can settle into a routine like growing cotton year after year. And then God will send a bull evil our way. He jolts us out of our comfort zones and we're forced to look for new ways of living for Him. Sometimes God allows, yes, God allows difficult things into our lives in order that we might better glorify Him. The best thing that can happen to some of us is that God sends a bull evil into our lives. 
God was building Elijah's faith by supplying him supernaturally through the ravens. But then came a point where God said, Elijah, time to go. Elijah was probably pretty comfortable by that time in in that ravine and by that brook. You can be in the middle of God's will and God can say it's time for a change. And when God says that, it's our responsibility to obey. And another lesson we can learn from this is one that is so well known, it's almost, it is a cliche, but it's important. And very few people actually live this out. And that is we need to learn to trust God every day, one day at a time. We must learn to live today, today. You cannot live tomorrow, today. And you can't live next week, tomorrow. Let me read you a quote I came across from from the book for the living of these days. The reason so many of us are overwrought, tense, distracted, and anxious is that we've never mastered the art of living one day at a time. Physically, we do live one day at a time. We can't help ourselves. But mentally, we live in all three tenses at once, and that will not work. You will not live effectively today thinking all the time about yesterday, and you will not live effectively today anticipating tomorrow. Jesus himself said that. He said, tomorrow's got its own share of trouble. He said, you concentrate in living for today. Elijah was not given his second step from God, until he had taken the first. One step at a time. First, confront Ahab. Second, go to the brook. God promised he'd provide for him there. And God did not tell him the next step after that until the brook had dried up. You may feel this morning as if your brook has dried up. Perhaps it's a health issue or a financial issue or a family issue. Things have gone wrong, maybe even in an area where God's blessed you in the past. A common testing ground that practically every Christian will face is when your brook dries up. And it almost feels as if God has betrayed you. And he doesn't do that, but it can feel that way. And during these difficult times, redeem that testing by entrusting yourself to the Lord in an even deeper way He will lead you to the next step in your life. It might mean getting out of your comfort zone. It might mean picking up and leaving the brook when you were just getting used to that wonderful routine. But God will lead you where it is best for you to go. Let me give you a synopsis of a verse that I'd encourage you to write down. It's it's about this. Psalm 84, 11. And it says in a nutshell, God will withhold no good thing no, he, won't, he will withhold no good thing from you when it is God's will you want most of all. So if you are sincerely committed to wanting God's will, the Bible says God will withhold no good thing from you. Paul admitted he had to learn that, but he did, and God led him every step of the way. Now Elijah had, an op, had, a, had a choice to make. He had to make up his mind and consider his own testimony. What's he going to do when the brook dries up? Is he going to complain? When our brook dries up, but when we say praise the Lord, it brings great honor to God. It gives meaning to the test, and it leads to the next step in his plan for you. Do you want to be led by the Holy Spirit? Do you want to step by step, step by step, take it at the leading of God? No matter where you're at right now, no matter what phase, what stage, whatever word you want to use, whatever, no matter where you're at right now, where you are at right now, whether you feel as if your brook has dried up or not, praise God. Tell God you trust Him. Say to God, I will trust you. You have led me so far and you will lead me the rest of the way somebody from church mentioned this to me a while back and I agree Um, I love that song I love that song that the praise team 
uh, sang, and it's one of my favorites, except for one word, one word I don't like. And it says, God has never failed me yet. Cross the yet out. God will never fail you. God will never fail you. I don't care if you live to be 100. God will never fail you. And we will spend eternity thanking him for his faithfulness. And so as you trust God, as you trust God and say, I will praise you right now, no matter what's going on. Lord, I'm going to keep on keeping on, and I'm going to trust you to lead me to the next step. He will lead you. Real simple closing today. Real simple altar call today. I'm not even going to dawdle over it, but I think it's a profound one. As I said, the Bible says that God looks throughout the earth for a heart fully devoted to him. Does that describe you? Does that describe you? If it does, then praise him. Otherwise, come to the altar and make a renewed commitment to God and say, no matter what happens, I'm yours. If you lead me beside a brook, if you lead me to a brook, I'm happy and contented here at the brook, and then that brook dries up, I'm going to trust you to take me to the next place. No matter what, Lord, I will praise you, and I will trust you, and my heart, Lord, in your strength will be fully devoted to you. You want a heart that's fully devoted to the Lord. The altar is open and the invitation is given to be like Elijah. When I read Elijah's story, it's like, whoa, what a man of God. What an amazing giant of a man of God. And then you turn over to the New Testament. And what's the New Testament say about him? It's that he was a man just like you and me. Man, just like us, with his own failings and foibles, and down the road we'll even look at a couple of them. But yet God used him mightily because his heart was devoted to him. Your heart devoted to God today. I urge you to make that commitment. The altar's open, invitation given. As we close today, um, I have to tell you, the song that we chose to end with today just went perfectly along with what Richard had to say, and the song is called Trust in You. It's a Lauren Daigle song, um, but it points right back to everything Elijah did. You know, to, to, to give orders like that to a king, first of all, you gotta be pretty brave, right? And then to know that you're the most wanted and all the your hearth and everybody's looking for you so they can, you know, get rid of you. And to know and trust in God to do exactly what he was told and God provided daily provisions, safety, food, water, and to think that he can do that for us too. You may not have to go live by a brook and <laughs> drink the water and hope the ravens come and feed you daily, but I think that we're all probably in the same situation Elijah is in, and that is daily trust in God that he will provide for each and every provision that is needed. So as we stand to sing the last song, don't take Richard's words and just let them go. This altar is open. God is looking for hearts that are ready to change and ready to commit. And if that's you, come on up. So we'll finish singing this last song called Trust in You. Letting go of every single dream, I lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering never changes what you see. I've tried to win this war, I confess. My hands are weary, I need your rest. 
Mighty warrior, king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Truth is you know what tomorrow when we're starting to feel comfortable. We will trust. We will trust in you. You know best now and forever. You have earned our trust. You have earned our trust. You deserve our trust. And we will give you praise, Lord, whether we are Surrounded by abundance, or whether we are in the midst of poverty, we will give you praise for you are worthy. We love you today. We thank you today. We praise you today in the marvelous and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.